One possibility is that there are no IP addresses available for us. Welcome to the Traveling with Technology presentation on Wi-Fi. The objectives for the, this presentation include the following. Describe the five Wi-Fi issues you might encounter in an RV park. Describe the functions of a Wi-Fi access point, router, and repeater. Describe how to determine whether Wi-Fi security measures have been implemented. And identify Wi-Fi signal strength tool. Wi-Fi is based on an 802.11 standard. 802.11b, g, and n are used commonly in RV parks. The chart you're looking at compares those three standards along with the more current 802.11 AC. All of the Wi-Fi radios are limited to a maximum power output of 1,000 milliwatts. Most RV parks only utilize the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. A wireless local area network is a network that links two or more devices using a wireless distribution method like Wi-Fi. A station is any client device in that network. It might be a laptop, a printer, a cell phone, whatever. In a wireless network, the station communicates with the access point, and each station has to contain one or more radios and associated antennas. All of the Wi-Fi devices manufactured or sold in the U.S. must comply with FCC standards. Therefore, each device is given a unique FCC ID. The two most important pieces of information about any Wi-Fi device are the transmit power and the receiver sensitivity. The examples shown are for a Dell desktop and a Samsung Galaxy S4. The power output shown in the slide was determined by going to the FCC website using the specific FCC IDs for both the Dell and the Samsung devices to come up with the maximum output power generated during the FCC tests. Let's address a few more definitions. An access point is a device that allows wireless stations to connect to a wired network using Wi-Fi. A wireless repeater takes an existing signal from an access point and rebroadcasts it. Wireless repeaters typically reduce throughput by up to 50 percent. A network switch logically connects devices together on a LAN. A wireless router determines the next network point to which a packet should be forwarded towards its destination. Major functions for the router include acting as a dynamic host control server. DHCP servers are where IP addresses are assigned by the router. This is referred to as dynamic allocation. The number of IP addresses is frequently limited by the size of the associated lease address pool. Wireless routers frequently support network address translation, or NAT. The router also supports radius functions for authentication, as well as providing firewall functionality. The real purpose of this presentation is to try to address or understand some of the common Wi-Fi complaints. For example, my laptop or other station device can't connect to the RV park's Wi-Fi. And when I am able to connect, the speed is brutally slow. Another problem we encounter is we can't seem to stay connected. The connection drops frequently. In some of the RV parks we go into, we're only allowed to connect one device. And we have several we want to connect up to the Internet. When I try to get help from the people running the RV park, they don't seem to be able to help. It's like talking to a box of rocks. A big part of the solution to these problems is to put an access point in a router in your RV. 
what you've done by adding an access point and a router inside the RV is actually created a wireless LAN so that all of your station devices are actually connected within your own local area network. The access point within your RV appears to the campground access point as though it were a single station device requiring a single IP address. Therefore, it resolves the issue where campgrounds will only assign you a single IP address. In fact, the access point in your coach mirrors the functionality of a station device, including having being able to utilize adaptive power level. To reiterate, what I'm actually doing is building out a wireless LAN inside the RV. That is, all of my station devices connect to my own access point, which has an internal router, and it in turn connects to an external antenna. The chart shows four Wi-Fi access point alternatives for the RV. In my particular case, I happen to be using a Wi-Fi Ranger solution. However, there are a number of alternatives available. The chart shows four of them. It also provides information on cost, ease of setup and support, radio transmit power, types of security available, and Wi-Fi network elements. If you're handy, consider a do-it-yourself alternative. There are units available for under $100. The embedded link on this page will take you to a YouTube video that will show you how to set one up. The only change I might suggest is that you use a Ubiquiti Nanostation M2 for better coverage rather than what's suggested in the video. Thanks to Ken Wiseman, the RV Navigator, for pointing this video out to me. Before we go any further, we need to talk a little bit about antenna definitions. Antennas, by their very nature, are passive devices. They don't generate any energy. They simply focus it. A receiving antenna will intercept RF energy and convert it to alternating current to pass along to a receiver. A transmitting antenna, on the other hand, receives alternating current from a radio and in turn converts it to RF energy that's radiated out. Frequently, a single antenna will perform both receiving and transmitting functions. Antennas are designed to be either omnidirectional or directional and serve as a beam and that's for both transmission and reception of RF signals. The chart in the lower left corner shows a typical dipole antenna. It's an omnidirectional antenna. It broadcasts in both horizontal and vertical planes in all directions. With an omnidirectional antenna, if we want to increase the range of that antenna, what we will typically do is reduce the gain in the vertical or elevation plane. Think of this like pressing a meatball. The more you flatten it out, the wider the diameter becomes. The same principle holds true for a beam antenna. The narrower the beam, the further out you can reach with that specific antenna. Since a beam antenna only radiates in one direction or receives in one direction, it is far less susceptible to noise. Next, we'll talk about Wi-Fi interference. What are the symptoms and what are some of the causes? Interference symptoms include intermittent connectivity, unexpected disconnections, delays starting a data transfer, slow network speeds, difficulty pairing or connecting devices, poor signal strength, and limited range. Causes for these symptoms include Wi-Fi network overlaps, uh, and we'll talk about that more in a bit, interference from other electronic devices, and those might be older Bluetooth devices or microwave ovens or anything like a TV or any other Wi-Fi device. They can generate short-range interference. Another big cause of interference 
is physical obstructions. And that can be anything from a metal building to trees and rain or fog. Let's start by talking about network overlap. In the US, we use 11 of the 13 available channels. As you can see, adjacent channels overlap with one another. So if we want to avoid overlap, what we typically do is assign access points to channels 1, 6, and 11. When this condition occurs, we typically see slow network speeds and somewhat limited range. If this occurs in your coach, change the specific channel that you're assigned to. However, in most cases, this will be an RV park problem more than your wireless LAN issue. Receiver sensitivity is another very important factor. A typical access point should have rece receiver sensitivity somewhere in the minus 85 dBm range. What we're looking for for a good signal is somewhere in the neighborhood of minus 75 dBm. And of course, the receiver sensitivity has to be at a lower level than the noise level. And typically, we expect to see noise somewhere between minus 95 and minus 100 dB. Let's talk a little bit about path loss. It's a measure of how much signal power we lose over a given distance. Path loss or gain is measured in decibels, or dB. For every 3 dB of loss, we have our power. For every 10 dB of loss, we reduce our power by a factor of 10. The same principle holds for coverage distance. For every 6 dB of gain, our coverage distance doubles. For every 20 dB of gain, our coverage distance increases by a factor of 10. The link margin is the difference between the receiver sensitivity and the actual received power level. Notice that as the negative received signal strength indicator gets larger, the maximum link speed decreases. The graphic shows us how to calculate path loss. We simply add transmit output power, transmit cable loss, the transmit antenna gain, the path loss, the receiver antenna gain, receiver cable loss, receiver sensitivity, and a typical link margin, usually of about 15 dB. In the US, transmit power is limited to one watt or 30 dB measured at the output of the transmitter. Combined transmitter and antenna gain are limited to 36 dB for omnidirectional antennas and 48 dBm for directional antennas. You'll notice I've included the formula for path loss at the bottom of the page, where C is a constant for mileage, D is in distance, and F is the frequency in megahertz. This next graphic shows us how noise impacts our available bandwidth. If the current noise level was at minus 90 dB and the signal strength was at minus 80 dB, that would give us a signal to noise ratio of 10, which means we could only expect about five and a half megabits of bandwidth. This next graphic shows one vendor's take on how Wi-Fi should be laid out in an RV park. Personally, I have several issues with this approach, the largest of which is, is that they're using wireless repeaters as opposed to access points. That means that all of the Wi-Fi traffic will be passed through one 22 megahertz channel. Since omnidirectional antennas are the antennas of choice in this case, it also means that interference and noise will come in from all directions. A better choice in this case might be to use sectored antennas and access points in lieu of Wi-Fi repeaters. Let's take a little closer look at the Wi-Fi elements we find in an RV park. In a small RV park, you'll usually find one antenna mounted somewhere, and it will normally be an omnidirectional antenna. The access point is usually very close by. This is done to reduce cable loss. 
Well-designed larger parks will utilize sectored antennas at multiple locations. The access points are in turn connected to a centralized router and associated Ethernet switch. Internet connectivity will be provided by a cable modem, a DSL modem, cellular access, or even satellite connection. The hardware involved isn't terribly complex. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the process we go through so that we can actually exchange data between a station and an access point. That process is called synchronization, authentication, and association. Synchronization syncs up the frames between the access point and the station so that they can talk to one another. Authentication is how a node gains access to the network. It provides proof of identity to ensure the node is allowed to access the network. This is compatible to physically attaching an Ethernet cable to a node for a wired network. Once a station or node has been authenticated, it has to become associated with an access point. This is how the network determines where to send data that is intended for that specific station. You may wonder why any of this is important to you. It seems like such a minute detail. However, when you have an access point in your coach, something like a Wi-Fi Ranger, that device goes through the same process when it connects to the campground access point. What's more, if you're looking at the control panel on that device, it will give you those progress indicators you'll see when you get authentication and association. And if it fails, you'll be able to tell where in the process it failed. Having those clues may help you figure out why you're unable to connect. One possibility is that there are no IP addresses available for assignment. Most RV parks utilize a Class C network, which means they may have fewer than 255 available addresses. Let's take a hypothetical example. An RV park has 150 sites and allocates 250 IP addresses. However, some of the RVers enter the park with two laptops, two cell phones, and a tablet. It isn't rocket science to realize that you may exhaust all of your available IP addresses very quickly in this environment. Let's look at a second scenario. In this case, you're in an RV park with multiple Wi-Fi repeaters. You connect your tablet to the RV parks network and it works fine at the coach. However, as you walk from your coach towards the office, you lose internet connectivity. When you cross from the base serving area of one repeater to another, you may have generated an IP address conflict. This is typically due to a dynamic host control protocol misconfiguration between the access point and the repeaters. Dynamic host control servers manage pools of valid addresses and assign IP addresses out of those pools. In addition, the DHCP server identifies the amount of time a given IP address will be valid for a device. If there aren't enough IP addresses available in the DHCP pool, your station address will either get a 0000, 000, 000 or self-assigned IP address. When the lease time is too long, that particular IP address becomes unavailable for the remainder of that lease period. For example, if we were limited to 250 IP addresses and expected 50 new stations per day, it would allow for a maximum lease time of five days. If the lease time were set to seven days, it would mean that some of the stations would not be able to connect at times. Some suppliers' equipment have hard limits on how many concurrent connections you can have on an access point. For example, Cisco access points have a hard technical limit of 128, 
clients per radio. Before we get into RV park bandwidth requirements, I need to provide you a reference point. This chart shows end user bandwidth requirements for both download and upload speeds. Most users require about two megabits of download speed and one megabit of upload speed. Of course, there'll always be light users and heavy users that go along with this. So how much bandwidth would we need in an RV park to accommodate most heavy users? Let's go straight to the bottom line. If we had 50 concurrent users, we would need about 9 megabits down and 2 to 3 megabits up. The formula for this is in the chart. It's actually the number of users times the traffic gives us the bandwidth needed. The vast majority of data is bursty in nature. This means that the data is transmitted in short, uneven bursts or spurts. So an individual user is actually sending or receiving data less than 12% of the time. This means we can utilize statistical multiplexing techniques to take full advantage of the available bandwidth. The only real problem with this is that some users utilize a lot of streaming data. Streaming data includes large file downloads, digital audio or videos, or more precisely, movies. In fact, some campgrounds are beginning to block or restrict streaming data in order to protect the service for the other customer. We need to talk a little about security. The default for most access points is an unencrypted mode. On unencrypted networks, any station can monitor and record data. On unencrypted networks, the best thing you can do is make sure that your internet connections are through HTTPS links or that you're on a virtual private network. For the access point in your RV, make sure that you've employed WPA2 security with a strong passcode. You might also want to make sure that you always use HTTPS for your connections to the internet. Finally, we'll talk about a couple of Wi-Fi specific signal strength tool. The first of those tools has been around quite a while and it's called VI Stumbler. It helps locate nearby access points and provide some useful information about those access points. The three key pieces of information are the signal strength, the channel that's being used, and the type of authentication for each link. The signal strength is actually provided two ways. First as a percentage and second as an RSSI number. The closer the RSSI number is to zero, the stronger the signal. VI Stumbler also contains a channel graph which can help identify channels that are crowded. The second tool we're going to look at is called Acrylic Wi-Fi Professional. In addition to all of the VI Stumbler capabilities, Acrylic Wi-Fi Professional contains a brute force password cracking utility. It can be used to test password security. Any hidden SSIDs that are discovered from captured packets will be shown. If the laptop GPS supports the NMEA standard, the location of the Wi-Fi source will be visible in Google Earth. These are just a few of the features in this particular tool.